you will see some Zoom faces popping up because we have two virtuals and one human on our panel, or two humans on our panel. So, <laughs> so here we go. Okay, next up, panel discussion moderated by Ruchika Sikri. Ruchika is following her life's purpose and mission to create a better world by supporting globally accessible mindfulness, compassion, and well-being platforms. She is the former head of well-being and mindfulness learning at Google and is currently advising several startup founders and nonprofits in the wellness space. She had a successful corporate career of 25 plus years at multiple tech companies, including Google, Microsoft, and Cisco. Joining Ruchika via Zoom are Teresa Lee and Patrick Porter. And joining her live on stage is Nanea Reeves, and she will be introducing her panel titled Supporting Inner Wellbeing and Human Connection, Bridging Tech and Wisdom. Come on out. Rushika and Nanea, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be on this side of the audience today. Hi, hey, Gopi. How are you? Um, it's such a delight to be present here today with all of you and uh, hosting this panel, which is so close to my heart. You know, I've worked working in technology company for the last 20, 25 years. I've always like dabbled with this, like, oh, we're creating this wonderful technology for the world, which is so helpful and actually has helped us get through these last two years by staying connected with our families, with each other, continuing to do our work. And at the same time, you know, we know there's a lot of disruption that it can cause in our lives as well. And yesterday when Jack was sitting here, he asked all of us to raise our hands where we said we were asked to raise our hand if we are concerned about where technology can take us. And most of us did. And I'm so uh, glad to bring uh, this panel to all of you today of these three amazing founders who are doing work in the space of technology. We're bringing more human connection, wellness, and mindfulness to all of us, uh, and really explore this intersection. Uh, with us today, we have Nanea Reeves in person. Uh, <laughs> she is the co-founder and CEO of Trip. Uh, it's a app in the metaverse world, which we have been discussing quite a bit uh, during this conference. And she'll share a little bit more about herself and the work they're doing. We also have on the screen, uh, Teresa Lee, uh, the co-founder and the design director of the app called Pure, which is enabling human connection through compassionate inquiry at transformational conversations. And we also have Dr. Patrick Porter, who has designed, uh, is a founder, and um, he's designed this uh, equipment called BrainTab. There, it's on display in the display area if you haven't had a chance to check out. Uh, so delighted to have all three of you. Thank you from my heart for wow. taking the time and being with us today. Um, I'll start with you, Nanea, the human in the room with <laughs> us human. today. Well, kind of human. <laughs> <laughs> and the other two humans on the screen. Um, tell us about your own journey and what deeply inspired you to create TRIP uh, and what are you hoping to, uh, for it to serve to the world? And then we'll come to you, Teresa and Patrick, in a minute. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I just want to acknowledge how great it feels to be back at Wisdom 2.0 in person. I, uh, yeah, and I think uh, the pandemic, you know, it, in a weird way, it was the best thing that happened to Trip because we found our product market fit during that time. We create virtual reality experiences that bring together mindfulness structures, some gameplay mechanics, sound frequencies, and it's all architected to help you connect to yourself in a way. And it, it seems strange to use technology to unplug, but VR is actually very effective at bringing your awareness to be present. And when I first came to Wisdom 2.0, uh, it was a few years ago, it was right after we received our initial funding to create the company. And I was very inspired by this community and the conversation that was happening here. And since then, you know, we've certainly um, achieved a lot as a company, figuring it out as we go, learning from our users. And now we're getting ready to expand 
into augmented reality on the Niantic Lightship platform, thinking about how to bring people together in physical spaces uh, to engage in mindful activities as a community and transform the way the world looks around them. And then we most recently, which is uh, I think an interesting discussion, we just acquired the largest mindfulness community in VR called Evolver. And they have 30 live group meditations per week that they bring together, um, sometimes focused on recovery, mindfulness uh, tools to support you dealing with addiction. And uh, their death and dying conversation is one of the most active ones. So I think, you know, there's a very dystopian narrative around the metaverse, but there's also some good happening in the way we can use technology to connect. Mm -hmm. I'm so curious to also pull more threads on how this world that we're seeing more and more of us gravitate towards putting this headset on. We'll come to it in a minute, Nanea. Yeah. I would like to invite Teresa, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing more about yourself and what inspired you to create Pure and tell us what Pure is. Thank you, Richika. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here. My name is Teresa Lee. I am the co-founder and design director of Pure, the world's number one app for brain body well-being through 10 minutes guided power conversations anytime, anywhere. So how I joined Pure, my story began eight years ago when I met my genius husband, Richard Lee, <laughs> the, <laughs> the founder of Pure. So Richard is a biophysicist and an IPO founder. On our first date, the first thing I said to him was, hey, don't you think you're sitting a little bit too close? <laughs> <laughs> I was nervous. And, um, but he was so down to earth and authentic, which makes it easy to open up to him. So at that time, I was suffering major anxiety and depression. I was always angry and even being surrounded by a lot of people, I always felt alone. And regarding my health, I had a lot of health, um, chronic pain and I was always tired. So Richard showed me compassion and he said, just do pure, you will activate so much power that 90% of your problems will go away. And that just sounds so amazing to me. I said, it must be really expensive, right? And then he said, no, I teach people for free. So being failed by status quo from doctors, counselors, self-help books and videos, um, pills and diet, I thought what I don't have, you know, anything to lose. So immediately I start pure. And right away, I felt better. I felt more peaceful and more self-aware. And so in the next couple of weeks, I felt, I continued to feel happier and also noticed that my chronic pain was reduced. So I kept on going. And just within a few months, my chronic depression was lifted and um, happy and energetic became the new norm. And at that time, people around me, they're all saying, what are you doing? You seem so much happier. You have this nice aura and your skin is glowing. And so, um, so yeah. today I'm the happiest and that I've ever, ever been. I am, I have an incredibly marriage, pure pals all over the world. I have no more chronic pain and I am pills free. Uh, what gives me even more joy is I get to share pure with our members and watch their life transform. So Teresa, I joined pure as a co-founder because I just cannot keep something so miraculous to myself. Mm -hmm. Teresa, um, we can we can see this joy and you know just glow on your face right now. Tell us like what is what is pure? What do you do in pure? <laughs> yes. So now everybody's wondering, okay, what is this amazing practice? Okay. So pure is very simple. Pure simply help people activate the massive power that 
all of us already have inside us. So it's in it's like a Zen format. There's a sharer and a listener. So when Rachita and I do pure, <laughs> we um, I ask her five compassionate questions, and she take five minutes to share wholeheartedly. And all I need to do is listen with my heart. No <laughs> comment. No quick fixes. Um, only pure empathy. And then after she's done, then we switch role. Then this time around, she asked me five questions, and I answer. And so being being able to tap into my deep self and express how I'm feeling deep down and being heard by someone non-judgmentally and in return listen for them made me feel very worthy and loved. So naturally, my body feel great inside and out. You know, as Richie as Oprah says, <laughs> love is the pure. Uh, love is the cure. My, my bad. Love is the cure, which is very true, you know. And, you know, talking about the, 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 the power of pure, we have, all of our users have such amazing um, transformations. We have seen stress and anxiety drop, radically reduce and people become happier and more joyful. Depression goes away quality yeah. of life in the trees. I feel so too, you know, when I've done a couple of pures with you, just really feeling validated about who you are and how you're feeling that day. Not every day is the same for us. So thank you so much, Teresa, for sharing. Patrick, turning it over to you, tell us what is BrainTap? I remember meeting you when you came to Google and one of our colleagues invited us to come and meet with you and I'm like, what is this like headset we're wearing, which is guiding me into meditation since I have such a traditional practice. It was a little daunting, honestly, to wear it and you observed my behavior in there. But tell us what is brain tap and what inspired you to create it? Well, first of all, it's, it's a brain fitness company that we have now because what we found over the years is that people want to meditate, but they don't want to take the chance. They don't want to take the time to practice. So they don't do it very well. And so what we've done is we've used light, sound, and vibration to actually help people experience those deeper states. Uh, like in our research with uh, Ames Bhopal and the different universities, we're showing that anybody, even with no meditation practice, can reach those deeper levels. And then it just enriches that practice. So what inspired me, and hopefully it'll inspire some people out there, is that my dad was a chronic alcoholic. And the church came over and said, you need to learn this relaxation exercise. It was a practice called the Silva Method. And my dad became one of the first instructors in the country to teach meditation. And he became the trainer for all of lower Michigan. So I spent my childhood setting up chairs and doing conferences with my dad, <laughs> teaching people how to meditate to what's called the Silva sound, which was a very uh, unique sound like isochronic tones. And then we used uh, GSR devices. So I've been doing technology assisted meditation since I was a kid, uh, produced my first uh, meditation track when I was 12. And uh, just been in this business when I, I went, went to school for electronics, when people go, what's this helmet? Why do you have meditation? Well, those are my two loves. So I, I still don't feel like I've worked a day in my life. I just feel like I get to share with people. And the reason I'm saying that the audience, hopefully somebody would be inspired. My dad was like one of you in the audience that's here. Maybe you got dragged along. You didn't really want to be there, but you don't know who you're going to touch because we touch the lives of literally millions of people in 107 countries. So, and that was because my dad went and got help learning to meditate. So it's a big shift for a family. When you, when you shift as an individual, in our family, there were nine of us. So we all learned to meditate, we meditate together every night. And I think it's a great practice. Amazing. Thank you so much. And it's so great that, you know, Nicholas is here and your team is here to also show how the equipment works. And there are days like, you know, when I miss my meditation, and my husband and I just actually put on the brain tap and, you know, have the guided meditation with these special tones that kind of come through, which you say, like they induce that theta waves or something that help you uh, relax in the moment. So bringing it back into the room, Nanea, with you, you know, there is this um, kind of, I feel like this d divide like between us on like some people are just so excited, including my husband, I would say, with having two Oculus at home mm -hmm. and, you know, spending a lot of time on it. And I worry like for my children uh, to like have this equipment and it, 
reminds me, I can't help but think of Wally -E as the movie, right? Like where people are just sitting on their chairs with the screen glued on their heads and, you know, their fingers have just gotten used to like tapping on the screen. I see, so is there a world like coming like that? And when you speak about like creating wellness through that same channel, mm -hmm. help us understand, like, how do you perceive well, these two worlds to coexist. You know, I have found a lot of respite as a young person in peril playing video games. Mm. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of people focus on that. They focus on the violence, and we should be monitoring how our kids are interacting online, for sure. But for me, as a young person, to be in a world where I felt like a hero and I felt in control of my world in that space, I found very healing for me. And inadvertently, it also gave me a love for technology. And I've given public talks on why I think girls should play video games, especially those like Roblox and Minecraft where you can see yourself as a builder and a maker. I don't think I would have had a career in technology without that. And it's important for us to have 50% of the population also believing in themselves that they can be innovators. <sighs> and even then, it's a struggle. <laughs> Because other people won't believe in you as you, you know, try to bring your idea to the world. Um, so having that belief and, and also I was gifted a mindfulness practice when I was 15, like Patrick, very young. And it was from a mental health professional and it changed my life. And so the motivation for doing what I'm doing really, uh, you know, comes from an organic place of wanting to give back some of the benefits that I've received. You know, against all odds, I've been able to navigate a life for myself. And so that, you know, I'm proud of. And when I compare it to my sister who died from a drug overdose, which is probably the path I should, I should have taken, just given where we came from, I can see the power of these tools in a way that um, could be brought together for good. You know, there's a movement underway right now with the build out of the metaverse to really just use it as an expansion of a lot of the crappy models that we've built in this world to turn people into consumers of digital assets and you know, what, what I want to, and this is the right community to really, you know, to step up and start to bring consciousness into that ecosystem. Because if all we do is take our digital twins to virtual malls to buy digital sneakers, we suck, right? If we miss this opportunity to use tech to really drive a deeper connection. And so... I could see how VR and you know things like what Patrick are doing and what Teresa are doing are really about helping people connect to self more deeply. And then with what I see happening in the Evolver community in VR, where they're connecting to others in a way where they can give and receive support, it's been really fascinating to watch. And I'll just end with this one point that you and I were talking about earlier. They have, they have a community of men who show up to these support groups that they have online, and they open up in ways that maybe they're not comfortable opening up to initially in front of humans. And so, again, like to me, that's a kernel of something good that could be um, uh, expanded on, and, and it's not to replace the physical world, but can we look at these technology solutions as ways to enhance the human experience? And that's what I'm excited about. And that's why I love these type of communities because you've got a lot of wonderful builders and people who can make things happen who are also thinking about how to navigate life consciously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for sharing, you know, also your personal journey with us um, on this, Nenea. Like, what was like that one day when it became clear to you, when I was reading your bio, you've held like C-level leadership positions in many companies before. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could walk us through that day when it became clear to you to dedicate the, the 
you know, foreseeable future, if not your life, like to mm -hmm. some work like this, what came up for you, that conviction? Can you share that with us? I had an amazing husband who I lost to cancer. And it's almost the seven year anniversary. And mm -hmm. he had a very deep Tibetan Buddhist practice and he had a nonprofit organization. And, and it was in that grief process that I could see how these type of tools really help both of us get through a challenge that many of us will face. You know, if you have a life filled with loved ones and just the ephemeral nature of life, you know, there are moments that are so breathtakingly painful that we need support in. And so as I was emerging from that grief process, I realized I had this clearing that I could build my own life on top of it. And it didn't have to be through the lens of being less wonderful because he wasn't in it. It could actually be even more wonderful because we had been together. Mm -hmm. And it was that shift in that awareness that I realized, you know, I've been a COO for a long time and helped other people's ideas come to life. And I just sat there, it was actually at Burning Man I just kind of <laughs> sat there and went, what's the idea really that I want to bring? And, you know, I, it, it's become like this weird Higgs boson particle of, you know, I attracted the right investor for that, Tim Chang at Mayfield. And it, he just said, I've been waiting for someone to pitch me this idea. And, but it was really, what do I want to, what is my idea I want to bring to the world and then also a new way to work. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, can we create a work culture that's about bringing like-minded individuals, not from an ego standpoint, a more heart-centered standpoint and not from a place of condescension, but impact and, you know, we're still a work in progress, but that's also very important to me because I feel like it'll influence the product as well, mm -hmm. yeah. how we organize. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. I'm so glad that, you know, you've had that um, calling come to you because I feel Metaverse is going to become part of our life yeah, and there will be. be shopping and games and, you know, another sort of addiction that may get created. And at the same time, like meeting people where they are with some of these solutions to um, be, go from this online world to the offline world is so key. Um, There's a lot that can go wrong, right? Yeah. And I'm sure Tristan will, yeah. you know, yeah. help us, <laughs> we'll help that. us stay grounded. But even yeah. with the best intentions, we're going to make some mistakes. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. Teresa, coming back to you, um, hi, <laughs> and uh, really wondering, you know, as Nene started touching on this, that um, it's very bold and courageous to go in and say, like, I'm going to be a co-founder and mm -hmm. create this product and platform and dedicate, like, 20, you know, many hours of my day and all these years to it. And I've seen you and Richard, like, really stay with Pure Apps. So tell us a bit about, like, what have been some of the learnings or challenges that you have run into that were unexpected um, and how are you navigating that as a female founder and, and a creator? Thank you, Ruchika. Um, being a startup um, you know, co-founder, there are so many challenges that every day we're facing. And really how I navigate it is do a lot of pure. <laughs> I, I literally have three pure schedule in a day, morning, midday, and then afternoon to wow. help me like, you know, really boost my, have the highest resilience and to go through the day. And it's been really fun. I think what's so, what really keeps us going is, is the user success story. Mm -hmm. You know, um, as I was sharing earlier that we see so many miracles happen in people's lives. Um, you know, depression goes away and husband and wife fall in love over again. And we've seen parents become more patient, more loving towards their kids. Mm -hmm. And students, college students using Pure to 
boost their memories and have more focus. And myself, founders and engineers and leaders, they, they use Pure to boost their EQ and therefore they're enjoying higher success. That's really what's keep that's fueling us and keep us going. Chica. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I'm on one of the Pure Pals uh, thread with all of you. And it's really great to hear the sharings that people have and the insights that come through that compassionate inquiry, the transformational conversations you're creating. Thank you, Teresa. Patrick, coming to you, who is your audience right now? Where are you seeing like BrainTab being used the most? And um, yeah, like tell us a bit more about that. Well, we're, we're being used primarily right now in the, in the medical field, but we're going to out to the general public now. We've done a lot with even concussion care. Meditation and what you can get from that used to be invisible. Now we have technology that we can actually show what's happening physiologically. So it's not just about some hypothetical activity that's going on in the brain. We can show how the nervous system regulates, how breathing techniques work. And so from sports teams to mothers having children, I mean, we, we're teaching them specifics. We call it focused life outcomes. So you can actually be very specific about it. Uh, and of course, you can just be general too. You can just do it for spirituality if you want. You can just tune in and tune into your higher power and, you know, have that assist you as well. But I think that there's a, there's a missing link here that people think you have to become a Zen Buddhist or something to use this technology or any of these technologies we're talking about. And the reality is that uh, our bodies need this. This is like a natural thing that we need that downtime, that recovery and that time to tune in and commune with this higher power, this innate intelligence we have within us. So I think it, it touches everything. And I think we need many ways to get there because you know we have 8 billion people and they all need a way to get to that place. So I think it's great that uh, people like these kind of events where people are sharing all the different technologies and how they're coming together. Technology is not going away. And I think it's like somebody saying that automobiles are bad because uh, I'm sure they thought about that when they ran a horse ranch, you know, but now we, <laughs> we have automobiles. So technology is not going anywhere. And I think like, like everyone here knows uh, that they can be a smart thing. You can look at your phone and do your apps that are helping you to improve your consciousness and your life experience. Or you can just look at uh, 300 times a day at your social media post. You know, we want to we want to get them to use social media responsibly and, you know, get the best out of it. Because in ancient days, even a candle or a Jyoti meditation is technology. Mm -hmm. Even a chant is technology. So it's just a way that we define it. Where now we can take our internal technology and make it external. We can wear uh, we can wear, you know, Oculus or whatever. We can wear brain tap. We can use apps to talk to people. These are all things that are really good benefits. And of course, there's always the dark side to everything. So mm -hmm. we need to stay in the light and and, uh, and be positive about it. Thank you so much. Thank you all, all of you for uh, really joining us today. We have a couple of minutes, so maybe time for one or two questions if the audience has any. Okay, we have one person coming up. Thank you all for an inspiring talk. I'm, uh, by submission, not a big, big believer in immersing in technology for the purposes of connecting myself as a disclaimer. So with that doubt in mind, there's a couple of questions I have. You know, what is the responsibility? I come from an investments background, right? So my day job is managing large portfolios. And we do something called Monte Carlo simulations and Aladdin risk analysis and stress analysis, if this happened, this is what would happen to the portfolio. The end result is that the output is only as good as the assumptions that go in. When you're building technologies with millions of years of evolution, as Jack said and other speakers have said, that have taken our brain to get to where it's at, how do we know? Some of these are really benign, right? They're passive, they're very helpful. And there's a place for them. I, re I recognize it. I've used them myself. How do we know that they actually have the right assumptions built in so that the output will be right? And here's why. As we all know, meditation has a very slow, subtle effect. There's not immediate output like that. That's why meditation is so difficult, because we're conditioned. If I do this, this is going to happen. You do the meditation, it takes years for the results. So how do we know that that slow impact won't lead us to that place? And one last thing, in developing mindfulness offerings and my study in clinical psychology, one of the biggest risks 
is triggering trauma. Mm -hmm. When you leave somebody with a technology tool and you trigger their trauma because you don't know where they would stop, how do you control for that? Great question, all right. <laughs> well, we work with mental health professionals as well as neuroscience professionals on how we design our experiences. I had the really wonderful um, early opportunity to share with Jack Cornfield a very early prototype of TRIP. And there wasn't even any meditation incorporated into it. It was just a experience. And he's the one who suggested we put content that, you know, to plant seeds because he, he said, you get me into such a receptive state. And um, so really vetting with professionals. We collect data in our application through similar skills that are used in the mental health industry. They were actually designed by the National Mental Health Innovation Center with us. And so our body of data is actually rather rich. We're starting to do clinical studies as well with the goal in mind to really understand what's happening. We have a study in addiction recovery funded by the NIH that moved into phase two. We have another one with severely mentally ill run by the New York Office of Mental uh, uh, Health. And so I think working with academia is really important. And we're very humble to know that we don't know everything. And you know there are ways to work with academia and uh, the community to learn more what's happening and actually help people. Uh, and providing connection to the support that um, uh, ensures that we're not doing anything harmful. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I know that was a long question, and we're at time, and we're going to welcome the next speaker. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Patrick, Teresa, and Nanea for being with us today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.